Bible this morning, you can turn to Psalm 139. We're going to look at a few verses there. And as Jeff was mentioning last week, we spent some time in the parable of the soils. We've been talking about hearing, responding to God who speaks. Last week we looked at these four types of soil. All four heard the word of God. There was soil that fell, and seed that fell in the path, seed that fell in the rocky places, seed that fell among thorns, and then there was the good soil. And we said that all four heard the word of God. The difference was in how they responded, how they received it, how they responded, and whether or not they produced a crop. And so we talked a lot about how you respond to what you hear from God today determines how much you'll hear from God tomorrow. So the response part is, is really critical. What I want to work through this morning, though, is in, in that particular passage we looked at last week, all four heard the word of God. But what I want to work through is what about the times when you can't even hear God speak? What, is, what about the times when God seems silent? So what do you do? We'll just kind of walk through the last few weeks where we've been. What do you do when you surround yourself with the kind of people who hear from God, who seek after him, prophets and teachers, and you surround yourself with those people, diverse people, and you still aren't hearing God speak? Or or what happens when you, like we talked about in week two, where you make it a priority to position yourself to hear from God, where you get in that place where you can hear from God, you're practicing your disciplines, when you're reading your Bible, and you're praying, and you're fasting, and you're finding those quiet times, and you're still not hearing anything when God seems silent. What do you do then? What do you do when, like we talked about in week, week three, when you're, when you're open to the ways that God speaks, you're listening to the pages of Scripture, you're, 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 you're listening for promptings and from the Holy Spirit, you're open to pictures and dreams and visions, you're, you're wanting to hear prophetic words from God, but you're getting nothing. What do you, what do, you do in those times? And so this morning, what I want to cover is uh, is start to cover some hindrances to hearing God speak in our lives. When David wrote Psalm 139, he wrote this starting in verse 17. He wrote, how precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake... I'm still with you. So David starts in this particular part we're looking at here by saying, God, your, your thoughts are just so vast. I can't even count them, let alone comprehend them. In Isaiah chapter 55, verses 8 and 9, the Lord says to Isaiah, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways. He says, As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts your thoughts. So we need to keep that in mind as we're working through this and as we're thinking about how God speaks to us. That God's ways aren't our ways. They're just farther beyond what we could ever imagine. So when we get to verse 19, David writes this. If only you, God, would slay the wicked away from me, you who are bloodthirsty. They speak of you with evil intent. Your adversaries misuse your name. Do I not hate those who hate you, Lord, and abhor those who are in rebellion against you? I have nothing but hatred for them. I count them my enemies. You start to listen to David here, and it appears that he has a solution to the situation that he's in. And the solution goes something like this. If only you, God, would slay the wicked. How many of you have an if only you, God, would solution to your situation that you're in right now? How many of you have ever prayed, and if only you, God, would fill in the blank? You know what I'm talking about. You can, God, if only you, God, would fix my spouse, then I could have peace, and then I could be a, a real Christian or live a follow you. God, if only you would fix my teenager. If you would do that for me, God, then I would, then I would, or, or God, if, if only you would, would get me that job that I applied for. God, if only you would give me that raise. If, if, if only you would... You find that coworker that I can't stand another job. I don't want them to be out of work, God, but if you could just get them another job where I don't have to deal with them, then I could, you know, really be salt and light in the workplace. God, if, if only you would take away my urge to feed my addiction, then I'd get better. If only you, God, would heal this person. God, if only you would send people to me, then I could talk about my faith instead of asking me to go. Talk about my faith. Then, God, then I would share my faith. If only you, God, would. But how many of you know that your if only you, God, plan or your if only you, God, prayer may be preventing you from hearing God speak? 
God just told us in Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, that his thoughts are not our thoughts. And our ways are not his ways. In fact, Romans 8, 26 and 27 tells us how to pray. It says, in the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness, because we don't know what we ought to pray for. Because we don't know. So the Spirit himself intercedes for us with wordless groans. And he who searches the hearts and the minds of the Spirit, he such as our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. I want to say this. Sometimes we are so bent on our plans for God that we don't even hear His plans for us. We get so wrapped up in what we'd like God to do for us that we miss what He wants to do in us and His plans for us. David's enemies aren't going to go away. In Psalm 139, just because David has this idea. If only you, God, would wipe this out. God's not just going to remove them. In fact, it almost seems like God is silent when it comes to David's if only you, God, plan that he has. And so when God seems silent or it feels hard to hear God, here's where you start. Verse 23. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. I want you to take note of how many times David says me or my in that passage. Notice that even though David starts with this if only you God solution to a situation, he doesn't stay there for very long. In fact, the place that he starts when it comes down to getting real, he vents a little bit, he's frustrated a little bit, but look where he starts. Search me God. Know my heart. Test me. Know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. I want you to get this. David doesn't start out with a God change them prayer. He starts with a God change me prayer. He could shift the blame here. He could put it all on God. God, if you would just slay him, <laughs> take him away. If God would just show up the way that I want him to show up, wouldn't it be wonderful? Wouldn't life be different? He could put the blame all on his enemies. Man, if I didn't have all these people get in the way of my dreams, get in the way of what, I, what God wants me to accomplish, God, if he would just fix them, God. But he doesn't start with a fix them prayer. He starts with a fix me prayer. He starts in his own soul. Search me. Know me. Test me. God, is there anything in my heart that's hindering me from hearing you or stopping you from working in me? And so what I want to do, I, I've mentioned this verse a lot, but I want to preach through this verse this Sunday and next Sunday, I want, to, I want to break David's prayer down and talk about six hindrances to hearing God speak. We're going to look at three this morning. I was going to try to do all six, but I thought it'd be better to just break it into two. Talk about three this morning and three next week. And what we're going to do is we're going to start at the end of David's prayer in verse 24, and we're going to work backwards, back through verse 23, and talk about six hindrances to hearing God. Hindrance number one is our agendas. We've hinted at this already, but our agendas for God can hinder us from hearing from God. Our agenda for God can hinder us from hearing from God. So uh, notice in the closing words of David's prayer, he says, lead me in the way everlasting, or other translations put it this way, lead me in the everlasting way. So what's David really saying there? He, 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 I think he's recognizing his potential weakness. He's recognizing that God's way is higher than his way. God's thoughts are different than his thoughts, and he wasn't, doesn't want to be duped into following his agenda for God. He wants God's agenda for him. Because, again, Isaiah 55, God says, my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my thoughts. How far apart are they? As the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways and your thoughts higher than ours. So because of this, our agenda for how God should speak, our agenda for when God should speak, our agenda for where God should speak can actually become a hindrance to hearing God speak. Because we're looking in the places that we like for God to show up. So I want to look at this a little bit more. Turn, for, turn me really quickly to 1 Kings chapter 19. 1 Kings chapter 19, the Old Testament. While you're turning there, I'm going to set the scene for you. We did a series on Elijah a while back now. But in 1 Kings 18, we're going to get to 19 in a minute. 1 Kings 18, Elijah has a literal mountaintop experience. <laughs> it actually happens on the mountain. One of my favorite passages. I wish we had more time to go through this. It's, it's just it's this great passage. But in 1 Kings 18, they have this showdown. Basically, Elijah comes and says, listen, it's time to stop wavering. 
He basically says, if Baal's God, then go worship Baal. Baal is one of the false gods of the day. Go worship him if he's really God. But if the Lord's God, worship him. But stop going back and forth. Stop having one foot here and one foot in the other. Make your decision. Choose now. And so he says, here's how we're going to do it. We're going to build an altar. We're going to put two sacrifices on it. The prophets of Baal, you call on Baal and see if he answers. I'll call on my God, see if he answers. The one who answers by fire, he's God. And so it's a great story. The prophets of Baal put their sacrifice on the altar. They're dancing and yelling all day, Baal, answer us. And it's silent. There's just nothing. Elijah steps up. He has them dump water on his sacrifice, which is a whole message in itself because they were in a drought. So he's wasting water. Seems like wasting water on this sacrifice. 1 Kings 18, 38, 39 tells us that when Elijah calls on Lord, the Lord, it says, then the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, the soil, and also licked up the water in the trench. When all the people saw this, they fell prostrate and cried, the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God. Man, anybody just long for God to show up like that? Just in a way that's just, it's just undeniably, like there's just no way this is anything else but God. The Lord is God. Now up to this point in 1 Kings 18, God's been showing up like this for Elijah big time. In chapter 17, God fed Elijah using ravens to bring him bread and meat in the morning and the evening. So God uses birds to provide food for Elijah, which is really gross when you think about like what that food must have been like when it got to him, but, but, if, but amazing nonetheless. God provides for him in an amazing way. How many of you have been in a situation where you're like, I don't see how God's gonna come through? Maybe through the birds. Like it's just the way God works. Also, chapter 17, Elijah saw God miraculously provide for a widow. This widow had only a handful of flour, had only a little bit of olive oil and a jug. Elijah asked her to make a meal for him. She says, look, I've only got a handful of flour. I've got a little bit of olive oil. I was about to make my last meal for me and my son, and then I was going to die. Elijah says, no, 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 make me some bread first. And God does something miraculous. He takes that little bit of flour. He takes that little bit of olive oil, and he provides for this widow day after day. She's able to make a meal every day for Elijah, for herself, and for her family. And by the power of God, that little handful of flour never ran out, and the little bit of oil in the jug never ran dry. Because God showed up, miraculously, big time. Chapter 17, a boy stops breathing. Elijah goes in, stretches him out, himself out over this boy. The boy's dead. Elijah stretches himself out. Verse 21 says, he stretched himself out on the boy three times and cried out to the Lord, Lord, let this boy's life return to him. The Lord heard Elijah's cry and the boy's life returned to him and he lived. I mean, this is incredible stuff. Powerful stuff that Elijah's experienced. Now chapter 18, Elijah sees fire come down out of heaven and just consume this sacrifice that they made. This is amazing. And to top it off, the mountaintop experience off, they're in the middle of this horrible drought. Elijah tells Ahab that he hears the sound of heavy rain. Now, nobody else hears it. They've been a drought for years. And Elijah hears, he says, I hear the sound of heavy rain. Go look by the sea and see, what's, see if it's coming. And so a servant goes, he looks toward the sea to see if there's any rain, comes back and tells him there's nothing. Elijah tells him, go back seven times. And the seventh time, his servant says he's seen a cloud. And the sky grows black with clouds. And the wind comes up, and a heavy rain starts falling. So these are, this is like everyday life for Elijah. God just showing up, big way, big way, big way. Fire, rain, just providing amazing ways. So we get to chapter 19 now. Jezebel has threatened to have Elijah killed because one part of the story that I didn't share was after the prophets of Baal, that, that whole showdown on the mountain, he had the prophets of Baal put to death. Jezebel wasn't too happy with him. So she has a bounty out of his life. He takes off. He's running. He's discouraged. He wants his life to be over. He's in a cave hiding. And I want to pick up the story in verse 11, from 1 Kings chapter 19. It says this, The Lord said, Go out and stand on the mountain." in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Now, if you'd been reading 1 Kings chapter 17, and you'd been reading 1 Kings chapter 18, how might you expect the Lord to pass by? In power, right? You would expect 
him to show up in a big way, in the rain or in the fire or some miraculous way. It'd be easy to adopt an agenda for God like that. And it actually looks like it might happen almost. Look, it says this. It says, then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. If I'm Elijah, I'm like, okay, God, this must be when you're going to speak. You did it with fire. You did it with rain. Now I got this big wind. So what are you saying? But, but it says the Lord was not in the wind. And then after the wind, there was an earthquake. Again, I'd be thinking, okay, this must be the way God, he's giving me an earthquake now. This is really, I got fire, I got wind, I got earthquake now. Wasn't there a group, earth, wind, and fire? <laughs> but uh, maybe they're still around, I don't know. Um, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. The Lord was not in the earthquake. Verse 12, after the earthquake came a fire. Great, we just saw fire in chapter 18. Maybe this is how God's gonna speak, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, came a gentle whisper. Whisper. This is the first time we, we know of that Elijah heard a whisper. First time that God spoke to him in a whisper that we know. Maybe he had before, but we don't, we don't read about any of that. But I want to say this. Had Elijah created an agenda for God, that God show up in some big powerful event like he had done in the past, if he had an agenda for how God should speak, he might have missed that gentle whisper. But instead, here's what Elijah did. Elijah adopted a posture of expectation without agenda. Expectation without agenda. Look at verse 13. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood in the mouth of the cave. Then a voice said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? See what he did? He adapted to God's agenda rather than trying to get God to adapt to his agenda. God's not in the wind. God's not in the earthquake. God's not in the fire. That's okay. I don't need God to adapt to me. I'll adapt to him. I'll go to the mouth of the cave. I'll pull my cloak over my face and adapt to what he's doing at this moment in time so that I can get into his agenda for my life instead of trying to convince him to get into mine. And as he does that, he hears the voice. What are you doing here, Elijah? Expectation without agenda, fully expecting that God can speak, fully expecting that God will speak, but fully surrendered that, Lord, it's whatever way you choose. It's not about the way I'd like you to show up. It's how you want to show up. We should fully expect that God will speak while being fully surrendered to however he chooses to speak. So if you're having difficulty hearing God speak, a great place to start is with this question. Am I allowing my agenda for God hinder my ability to hear God speak? Are my plans for him getting in the way of hearing his plans for me? And if so, it's simple. Repent, turn away from that agenda, and adopt this posture that Elijah had. Posture of expectation without agenda. Ask God to lead you in the everlasting way. A way that's higher than our ways. Thoughts that are higher than our thoughts. So that's one hindrance to hearing God speak in our life. Second hindrance to hearing God speak that I want to talk about this morning. Probably the most obvious one is this. It's our sin. It's our sin. Verse 24, notice David says, see if there is any offensive way in me. The Christian Standard Bible has a footnote. It says, see if there's any idolatrous way in me. Sin is the stuff that we do that's offensive to God or it's offensive to other people. Now, I'm talking about legitimately offensive. I'm not talking about, you know, everybody's offended at everything. I'm not, I'm not talking about that. I'm a legitimately offensive to other people. And it's often the number one barrier to hearing God speak. Listen to what Isaiah 59, 1 and 2 says this. It says, Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor his ear too dull to hear. But your iniquities have separated you from God. Your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he will not hear. So I want to say this, if God will not hear you speak to him because of your sin, you can bet that your sin will hinder you from hearing him speak to you. It just gets in the way of that communication. Now, there's a lot of ways we could define sin. Some people define it as falling short of, of God's glory, missing the mark. My definition is simply this. Sin is anything that causes you to stray outside of the revealed will of God for your life. Anything that pushes you outside of the revealed will of God for your life. That could be ignoring it, or that could be blatantly disobeying it. Either one is still sin. Ignoring or disobeying what God has clearly revealed to you 
in his word, maybe through words that he's given you or pictures or the different ways that we've talked about God speaking, but it's going outside of God's revealed will for your life. I read an article on BibleStudyTools.com this week. It said, throughout the Bible, almost every sin reaches for things with some intrinsic value, such as security, knowledge, peace, pleasure, or a good name. But behind the appeal to do something good, sin ultimately involves a raw confrontation between obedience and rebellion. So it's often going after something that we want, but it's going after it the wrong way. We're looking for the wrong thing within it. So if we're straying outside of the revealed will of God, if we're in rebellion to what he's revealed through the pages of scripture, through the promptings he's put on our heart, through the pictures he gives us, through dreams and through visions, through the prophetic words that he, that he gives us, if we're in rebellion to what he's revealed, why would he speak to us? Why would he give us anything new? Why would he give us anything fresh? Now here's the good news. Jesus didn't come to just explain to us what sin was. He came to remove it. He came to deal with it. He came to free us from it. It's in his very name. Matthew 121, the angel says to Joseph, you're to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. That's why Jesus came. He didn't come to, to punish us for our sin. He came to take the punishment on himself for our sin. 1 John 1, 9 tells us this, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. But notice there's a big if in the beginning of that verse, isn't there? There's a big if. If we confess our sins, that's our part. Jesus will do his part. But let me tell you guys, we cannot cleanse ourselves. We can't get ourselves right before we come to God. We can't cleanse ourselves. We can only confess. We can only bring our sin into the light. And if we do that, he promises that he will cleanse us if we just bring it into the light. We'll receive forgiveness and we'll be purified from all unrighteousness. But if we keep our sin concealed instead of confessing, it clogs our hearing. It becomes a hindrance to our hearing. Listen to how David described it in Psalm 32. Psalm 32, I'm going to read verses 1 to 5. He starts out by saying, Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them, and in whose spirit there's no deceit. So this is someone who's living in the light. He says you're blessed. When you're blessed, you're in communication with God because you're in communion with God. You're, you're the blessing of God is upon you. David says you're, you're blessed like that. And then he says this. He says, when I kept silent, when I didn't confess my stuff. He says, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Does that sound like someone who's hearing from God? That sounds like someone who's, who's feeling a, a heaviness, like there's all this stuff weighing them down, clogging up their ability to hear from God. But look what he says, verse five. He says, then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity, I said. I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. He says, when I, when I brought it out, I was free. <laughs> the barriers were removed. The hindrances were gone. We could do that. We could trust that God's a good God. 1 John 1, 7 says, but if we walk in the light, and there's another if there, guys. If we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. It, like, it opens up a conduit to our hearing when we confess this stuff, and we're living in the light. And so the communication lines are open. So if we're having trouble hearing God speaking in our life, just ask the Holy Spirit, search my heart. See if there's any offensive way in me. No. Just because you're not hearing God doesn't always mean you're in sin. We'll get to that next week. There are times when God's just quiet. We'll talk about, you have to come back next week to get that part of it. But it's not, just because you, you're, you don't hear God doesn't mean that you're definitely in sin. But it could be that the Holy Spirit needs to show us if there's any offensive way in us. And from my experience, sometimes we don't even know we're doing it. Sometimes it's something we don't even realize is offensive. Sometimes it's something that we haven't, because... We wouldn't do it if we knew it was, well, hope we wouldn't do it if we knew it was going to be offensive. 
So confess it. God's a good God. He promises to cleanse us from it. Bring it into the light. It loses its power over us, opens up those lines of communication between us and between God. And then the third hindrance I want to talk to you about this morning is distractions. Distractions. There are uh, probably an unlimited number of distractions I could talk about that keep us from hearing God. I'm just going to mention three quick categories this morning. Distractions. Categories of distractions that keep us from hearing God. First category is this, the things that we are anxious or fearful about. David says, notice he says, search me, O God, know my heart, test me, and know my anxious thoughts. Know the thoughts that, have, that cause me to have fear and anxiety. Remember last week we talked about the four soils? And, and, and one of the soils that Jesus described like this, he said, still others like seeds sown among thorns, the soil among the thorns. He said, they hear the word, but the worries of this life, anxious stuff, the deceitfulness of wealth, the desires for other things come in and they choke the word, making it unfruitful. The Greek word there for worries, it means pulled in different directions. Distracts us. That anxiety, the worries, it distracts us from hearing God. So, not only does our fear and anxiety choke out the words that we've received and cause those words that we have heard to be unfruitful, but it actually, it actually distracts us from hearing future words that God would want to pour into our lives because we're pulled in different directions by these worries, by these fears, by these anxieties. So how do we rid ourselves of, that, of those anxieties and those fears that well up in us? We draw near to God. Philippians 4, 6 to 7 says it like this. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus, those fears are driven out. 1 John 4, 18 says, perfect love drives out fear. Can I tell you there's only one perfect? It's through God, through Jesus Christ. That's the only perfect love. Every other love is imperfect. So if you want that fear to go away, it ain't gonna come from your spouse, it ain't gonna come from your friends, it ain't gonna come, it's gonna come. And God may use those people to help drive fear out of your life, but it's gonna come through relationship with Jesus Christ, through the presence of Jesus Christ in your life because perfect love drives out fear. So that's one category, our fear, our worries. Man, we gotta ask ourselves, God, am I afraid of something? Am I afraid of what you might say? Am I afraid of what you might not say? And how do you get in that place? You just get in that place where the love of Jesus drives that out. That's one category. Second category that I want to talk to you about this morning is good things that are not necessarily God things. Good things that are not necessarily God things. What I'm talking about here is this. We can fill our schedule with a lot of good things that are not necessarily God things. Activities that are not inherently evil. Things that don't look bad, but they can consume you. So let me give you an example. Luke chapter 10, verses 38 to 42. Let me read this for you. It says, as Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. Now notice, it says preparations had to be made. So you're gonna stop there for a minute. Martha's not a bad person. She's not trying to do evil. She's not trying to go outside the will of God for her life. Somebody's got to get the house ready. Someone's got to get the food on the table. And so she's taking this on. She's making dinner. There's all these good activities that Martha's engaging in. But if you keep reading, it says she comes to Jesus and she asks him, Lord, don't you care that my sisters left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Verse 41, Martha, Martha, the Lord answered. You are worried and upset about many things. Good things. Many things that need to be done sometimes. Things that seem necessary. Things that maybe you think would never get done if you don't do them. Things that you say, I've heard this time after time. I have to do this. Really? Do you have to do it? You are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. Here's what I want to get at. Both the preparation and sitting at Jesus' feet were good things. They're necessary things at different times. But at this, there's a time for both. But the problem was, Martha was letting the good things that needed to be done distract her and get in the way, of, and she was missing the God things. 
the things that Mary was experiencing. And Jesus tells her, you're worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed. Man, there's, there's some wisdom in that little statement. I, I would love to do a message on that one sometimes, but I want to ask this. Is it possible that you filled your schedule in your life with so many things that seem good? So many things that seem necessary? So many things that seem like if you don't do them, nobody else will do them? So many things that you feel like you're going to be left behind if you don't pick this thing up? Things that you think, I'm going to miss out if I don't participate in this thing? And, and yet you're actually, you filled your life with so many of those good things that you could be actually missing out on the better things? The God things, the few things that are needed most, how often do we ask the question, why am I doing this? And that might be one of the most important questions to ask when you're asking, God, is this a God thing or is this a good thing? Ask the question, why am I doing this? Is this really something God is asking me to do or am I just doing it because it makes me feel good? Am I just doing it because it makes me feel important? Am I doing it because it makes me feel significant? Am I doing it because everybody else is doing it? Am I doing it because I got to keep up with everybody else? Am I doing it because I don't want my kids to be disappointed? I mean, I can go on and on here. You ask the question, why am I doing it? Can I tell you something? Satan is totally 100% okay with you filling your life with good things so long as they're not God things. There's a difference. He's okay with you doing a lot of activity. Can I tell you something? He's okay with you doing a lot of religious activity. Church activity, if it's not God calling you to do it. He's okay with that. He's okay with keeping you busy to miss out on the things. What, what, he, what scares him to death is when you start doing the God things, when you start clearing out the stuff that could be distraction. So guys, we need to ask God for discernment. God, why am I doing this? Is this a good thing or is it a God thing? Let me give you a third category for distractions. I'm calling this one routines that become ruts. Now, before I, I, I say how routines can become ruts and become distractions, let me say this. I like routines. Too much sometimes, but I like routines. I like rhythm. I like being planned. I like being scheduled. I think God has a plan. I've read this book from start to back many, many times, and God is not just out there going, gee, I wonder what I'll do today. He's got a plan. He knows where he's going. He knows where it's heading. I've read the last chapter. He's got a plan. Plans are good, okay? You need to, I'm an advocate to have a plan. Jesus said in Luke 14, he said, hey, if you want to build a tower, don't you sit down first and figure out, do I have enough money to build this thing? You know, you come up, you come up with a plan. So when I'm saying that routines can become ruts, that become distractions, I am not suggesting we don't need routines or rhythms in our life, I would, or that we don't need to be organized. Most of the time, I would argue the exact opposite. I would say that if you don't create routines and rhythms in your life, you're probably not creating any space for God to move. Your life's going to get crowded if you don't have routines and rhythms in your life. That routines can actually create space for God to speak. Jesus, remember, had a habit of getting up early before everyone else was sleeping and going off to quiet places. He had routines. He had habits. So, hear that first. Having said that, routines can become ruts when they leave no room for divine interruptions. When they leave no space. Healthy routines can be a catalyst for growth. But routines become ruts when they become a conduit for comfort. Hear what I'm saying there. We can get stuck in this, well, I've always done it this way mentality. We get stuck there. We do. I'm not talking about bad stuff here again, guys. I'm talking about routines. I've always done it this way. Listen, the Israelites in the Old Testament... They, they had a routine that became a rut. They were slaves in Egypt. Remember that? But even though, and, and God calls them out, he sends Moses in, brings them out, bringing them into this new place, a place that was going to be amazing. But it was unfamiliar. It was uncomfortable. And so when God calls them out into a place that was better for them, because it was unfamiliar, what did they want to do? They wanted to go back to Egypt, back to their routine, back to the way they had always done it, because even though they were slaves, it was comfortable. They knew what to expect. That's the kind of routine that I'm talking about. That's the kind of routine that gets us in a rut. When we play it safe, when we don't leave any room in our routine for divine interruptions, when we're, when we're not willing to allow God to call us into something new, something unfamiliar, something that's a little scary, then a routine becomes a rut and that becomes a distraction. Guys, it happens with our spiritual disciplines, with our spiritual practices. I got a couple go-to ones that I love to do. I love to read the scriptures. I've grown to like silence. I used to hate it, but I like it now to listen to God. And I really like to journal. 
But if I just stay there and I don't ever stretch out of there, or if I'm doing those and I'm not hearing anything and I'm not willing to stretch and say, okay, God, I'm going to try something different, then my routine has become a rut. It's become a distraction. That sounds crazy, right? That the Bible could actually be a distraction for what God's wanting to do in your life, but it could be if it's just a routine, if there's no life in it. It could become a rut if it becomes familiar. This happens in our, in our ministries and the way we serve. When we do stuff, because, well, we've always, always done that. I've always served. I've always worked with the kids, or I've always worked with adults, or I've always worked with this particular age group. I've always taught this class. I've always led this small group. I've always... What if God's calling you to something different? Your routine can become your rut. What you're comfortable with becomes the thing that actually prevents you from hearing what God might be trying to say. That's what I'm trying to say here. Routines that become ruts become distractions that can hinder us from hearing God speak in our life. Now, the good news is this. Jesus made provision in the cross to overcome all of our agendas, to overcome all of our sin, to overcome all of the distractions that we just talked about here, to overcome the three hindrances that we're going to talk about next week. He made provision to deal with every one of those in his finished work on the cross. And so I want to close with this. As as we get ready to prepare our hearts for communion, I want to read this verse and show you what Jesus did to deal with the hindrances in our life. And then I'm going to give you a chance to deal with some of these hindrances as you come to the table. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 24 to 25 says, He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. See what he's saying there? He's saying that all the stuff that keeps us from hearing from God, these distractions, these different, these these hindrances, he says Jesus, Jesus died on a cross so that we might die to our sin and live for his righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. That's the stuff that David was praying for. That's where David started. He said, God, start in my soul. Don't change my enemies. Change me. If I'm not hearing from God, if I don't, Jesus said, You'll, my sheep know my voice. They hear it. If we're not hearing, go to the shepherd. He took it all on the cross so that we can have that relationship with him. Go to him so you'll hear his voice. We all, we're like sheep going astray, but you've returned to the shepherd and overseer souls. So this morning, as the elders and their wives come forward to help serve communion this morning, if you guys would come right now, I want to just lead you in a prayer and just a time of preparation for receiving communion.